Hello, everybody. Welcome into another edition of Head Coach U. I am Brian Fisher, joined as always by former BYU and Virginia head coach Bronco Mendenhall. Bronco, we took some time off, but uh, we're back on a season two here of, of Head Coach U. And we, we got a pretty exciting guest list over the next couple of weeks, starting with Dr. Craig Manning, who we have on right here. And, and Bronco, this is somebody that uh, you, you know particularly well. Yeah, uh, Craig Manning has been someone I've, I've worked to get on for, for quite a while, and his schedule is really busy. Um, but Craig and I got to know each other at Brigham Young University. Uh, Craig was coaching the women's tennis team at that point, just finishing his PhD in an area and before writing a book called The Fearless Mind, which every every team that I coached at BYU, we implemented those or that strategy um, all the way through Virginia. And it's made a huge influence and impact on my personal life. So and in the meantime, I think it was Wednesdays at noon, maybe, but uh, we had a standing uh appointment would go hit tennis ball so craig would try to dial in my swing which he had no success with but it relieved stress and we just had this great exchange of ideas um and i learned so much um and the impact that that's left on me but also the ability to transfer it onto my teams i just thought it'd be so great for our listeners to to be introduced again to craig if they haven't heard or didn't know of him and hear about the work that he's doing and so craig man since we were at byu together where's the world taking you i know but i'd love for everyone else to know yeah, great. And one of the things that is so interesting to me, interesting to me as you're even introducing that is just the memory recall, right? Recall is critical and Bronco still remembers what day that was and when we we're doing that. But um, yeah, from BYU, I finished my PhD in applied sports psych and, and uh, continued to work at BYU, but moved from tennis coaching to be the mental strength coach was the title that that I'm, I like because it's about strengthening the mind and the more you strengthen and the more you learn to control it, the less defense mechanisms we develop, which uh, I like to go back to some Disney to keep it simple. I love Shrek. I think Shrek is such a, a good person to learn from. And he talked about the layers to the onion. Uh, what I've learned as time has gone on is that the more layers to the onion we develop, the more dysfunctional we become. Whereas the more um, we can be true to ourselves or learn to control our mind and, and to control the subconscious and trust ourselves, the less layers we need. I, I think we always have some layers, but the less layers and the more high functioning we become. And I've seen that in athletics and music and in business and really helping people to learn to trust themselves and unlock their talents and, and their skills, their strengths. I'd love to talk about strengths with you today, um, Bronco, a little bit. I just something has just happened with the Milwaukee Bucks that in the last month or so that we have, you know, we went through a period where we were struggling and we turned it around with this. But I'll, I'll go there in a minute. But from there, started working with the U.S. Olympic team, the Winter Olympics, which is just up the road in Park City, which led to uh, Sochi, Vancouver, then Sochi Olympics, that our teams that were doing the mental strength training on, we won six of the nine gold medals total. We won six of them, and the coach there was just fun to work with. That From that, a strength coach went to Cleveland Cavaliers, and so mm -hmm. after that, LeBron James had gone from Miami back to Cleveland, Kevin Love, who was a seven-time All-Star, had gone from the Timberwolves down to Cavaliers, and he had all this talent, but the culture was fractured. Mm. And so they brought me in to try and help him with mindset and culture and were able to turn it around. A lot of stories there. We ended up winning a championship, and then I got recruited by the Jazz and the Bucks because at the same time after Sochi, the director of our sports science department at the Olympics went to the Milwaukee Bucks, and the team was just right at the beginning there. So after a couple of years with the Cavaliers, they were trying to recruit me in there and the Jazz were trying to recruit me. And I ended up choosing the Bucks because I was learning some things around team and culture. And I met a young man that he's given me permission to be able to use his name and met him doing a speaking engagement. Funny Bronco, the day I gave a BYU devotional, so you'll ask what that is, which was stressful. Yeah. I jumped in my truck as soon as I was done and drove up to Salt Lake and did the first three-hour training for the box and met Giannis Antetokounmpo and was so impressed with the humility, just mm -hmm. so impressed with the humility and his wanting willingness and wanting to learn. And I've been working with him for years, and he is a wonderful human being and, and one of the best in the world right now. So that's been a great journey doing that. You know, a couple of things you just said, and and it struck me from the very, very, very beginning when you and I met, and, and I knew immediately you were someone I could learn to, but also someone I wanted to be around. I love lifelong learners. I love people that are trying to figure out hard things. 
but figure out hard things to help other people. I, I love that part. And so you mentioned culture and mindset. It's interesting. Yeah. I'm giving a corporate presentation tomorrow on that very thing. And so when I'm anytime I'm given a chance to, to uh, choose what I'm going to speak on, the, the culture and mindset creation, I think, precedes performance. And if that's done really well, there's foundational elements that I think then lead directly into being able to trust yourself. Um, because of the, the cultural infrastructure and mindset infrastructure you build that kind of allow that to happen and then maybe leverage the strengths you're talking about. And it's just been fun to think about uh, in, in the world of skiing, too, and the aerialists and when they're going and flipping and backwards and upside down and yeah, you know, what yeah. that would take to do that. And so for you to have, the, have to have had the chance to apply it in intercollegiate athletics in so many different sports while people are skiing down mountains and flying off jumps. And then in front of the world, as they try to put an orange ball through a hoop, right? There, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's lots of different things go on. And so I'm wondering if there's, a, an, I don't know, a commonality or, yeah. or a, a beginning place or a sticking point, or, or if you were to sequence it, how do you even start? So I love to, I love the question. So I want to go back to, if it's okay, the human, so the mind, right? The conscious yeah. mind is the top 10%. At least Freud drew it that way, which makes it simple. The conscious mind is 10%. The subconscious is 90 that stores all of our skills, all of our knowledge, all of our memory. But I just, the conscious mind is human consciousness is such a fascinating thing. And as I continue to study it, the more I feel like I'm understanding it and what we tend to do that, that space, it's always moving. It's ever changing. It's never still. So it's subjective. It's hmm. completely and utterly subjective. It's never objective. You can't, you can't quantify it that it's ever standing still. So how do you learn to control it? But yet control is at the key of all mental illness, all mental I issues. My wife always buys me the DSM whenever the new one comes out. The newest one is the DSM-5 TR, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of All Mental Disorders. And she gets it to me just to, to keep, my, keep it fresh. But mm -hmm. it's a book this thick. It's wow. massive. And that's what happens when you're not in control of your mind. It's like flavors of ice cream. There's no end to the creation of flavors, you know. And there's no end to the complications that happen if you don't learn to control your mind. And so the very first part is how do we control something that is always in motion? Yeah. And so what we try to do is people say, well, think positive. That's really hard. And if I could actually break that down for a minute, how do you think positive when you're hurt and in pain and you're trying to sell yourself to be positive? Well, that, that's actually creating cognitive dissonance. I had a gymnast at BYU that was a, a real serious injury. And she's trying to, she calls me up and I remember I was on the road with one of the teams and, and she's like, I know I got to think positive. I know I got to think positive. I'm like, no, you don't. Because if you're trying to think positive and you're telling yourself, Hey, I feel good. I feel great. And you're in pain. That, that's called lying, you're <laughs> lying to yourself, which only creates more stress. Right. And so this whole idea, we positive and negative is energy. And yes, we want to bring positive energy to life. But we don't want to, if we're trying to think positive, it forces us into this place where we're lying and we can't trust ourselves. And so to answer your question, do you ever thought, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, the, the, and for, the, for our listeners, um, I was talking to a colleague who's an athletic director, and this is to, to just carry on with Craig's point, is uh, in that department, there were 750 student athletes. Yeah. Over half were seeing a mental strength coach or a mental coach. Yeah. to try to overcome anxiety or depression or lack of authenticity in how they speak to themselves, right? As you're saying, lying. That's it. That's and, the key. Yep. and there would have been more student athletes that would have used the services if there was enough room and enough people to meet with them. And so this, this is, it's so widespread. Anyway. This is the key, what Bronco was saying there. So in the field, we talk about trying to be positive to gain more control, really what that is. But we're learning that spectrum isn't really accurate for your conscious mind. Again, we want to have positive energy. I don't want to under, undermine that. But then so I was always like, well, the research says we can see the heat signatures. This is not theory. We can see it through the functional magnetic, the fMRI. We can see it. And the researchers, the neuroscientists have been able to say that when we're in the wrong mindset, it's we're reactive with our self-talk. That reactivity, the don't, don't do be this, don't do that creates triggers fight or flight which is fear-based mm. and now you're a creature of habit and that is a part of the structural part of the brain that's called the amygdala mm -hmm. and what happens is the more you are reactive you're thickening 
those patterns and actually increasing in size as you age. So you're becoming an honorier, grumpier, more stressed out, miserable person the more you age, which if, that, if that's somebody's goal in life, go ahead and keep being reactive, right? But it, it, it's what leads to low functioning. The high road, the opposite, the neuroscientists don't call the opposite, which is the hippocampus, proactive. And I love this bronco. So these neuroscientists, the technically the opposite of reactive is proactive, which is yep. playing to win, which means, you know, the do's, which I love. And yep. you and I have talked about this, yes. be more proactive. But there's there's another step in understanding this that you just said that I think is is amazing to me. To be deliberate, it's not necessarily just being proactive. Because then you're a robot trying to always be, I got to think this way. I got to think this way. I got to think this way. That's such a black and white way to think. That's not what actually gives us control. It still creates stress. Because what if I'm not being proactive? Then I'm like, I'm spying on myself. Right. The key is, and here's the biggest thing I've learned. It, the key is not to think positive or proactive necessarily, but to be precise and exact. Uh, if you're precise and exact, now you're finding truth and to answer your question i don't care i don't care whether you're religious or not i don't care what color skin you are or where you're from the key to learning to control your mind is accuracy of thought mm -hmm. which is what truth is that will bring you to truth and truth is where the authenticity is and that's that never changes and that's what gives you the greatest sense of control i i love that and and working as a leader uh and working to pass on this information right, from what I learned through Craig to my team and to coaches, right, which is secondhand. And, and there's a struggle there um, because, right, um, mm -hmm. still learning. But th this idea, I, I love the idea of being able to have a fearless mind. When I think about that, it's just what a cool way to live. Um, yeah. But what I was realizing along the way is calling myself out when I didn't have a fearless mind and I'm fearful. And then it was like, OK, how come? And, and trying to recognize that as fast as possible to self-correct yes. was, was well, really, so I, I'm not going to say I ever still to this point, and I have a long ways to go. I haven't mastered the fearless yeah. mind, but what I can do is self-correct more quickly and yeah, recognize well, it than what I used to. Yeah. Love yeah. It. So to go, to go deeper here. So the key is to learn to really have control and to have greater occupying the space and have your own thoughts. It's precision and accuracy of what, or well, how does the mind work? Well, we have 80 to 100 trillion neurons firing sy through synapses in our brain. And so that firing. So how a thought exists. Thoughts are our self-talk, but it's our self-talk is our words. Mm -hmm. So every time we have a thought, every word we use, it's firing a message from one synapse to the next. And to the, through the synapses, creating a reverberating nerve. Mm -hmm. And every time we have a thought, that firing like, a, like a, a piston in an engine that fires is the energy. Thoughts create energy. So how do we learn to control it? Language. I learned this. This is massive. Language completely and utterly dominates human thought. So how do we master this? By mastering our choice of words. How we talk to ourselves internally, how we talk to others, it's our own language. And the more you master that, the more you're deliberate, the more you're choosing how to think and you're in control of your own mind. <laughs> There, there was a there was a, a moment where a coach, one of my assistants, or it might have been me. I, I don't remember where during, it's during a practice and I hear someone and it might have been myself. I, I'll claim it if it was. I just don't remember for sure. And I heard these words, quit saying stupid stuff. <laughs> and, but the point was the effect it was having right yeah. on the people around that individual and our team and himself was just we had this principle, less drama, more work that the, yeah. the drama was usually tied to the words. And so yeah. anyway, I remember, so he didn't know all the scientific uh, um, structural components, what you just said, but the, these words came out during practice, quit That's saying funny. stupid stuff. <laughs> this is so, you're going to love this story too. We're in Milwaukee by this point, my wife and I, and we've got two big dogs. We've got two big newfies, which one's 150, the other's 120 pounds. So we take him to the groomers twice a month because that's a lot of grooming. <laughs> and so we go into the groomers. My wife loves to listen to this podcast of a lady who's a millennial, which maybe we'll talk about or not. But we're driving along and Mackenzie says to me, Sharon's got a new podcast. You want to hear it? I'm like, yeah, chuck it on. Love to hear from her. She's like, yeah, but I got to warn you. The person she's interviewing, he studies in the same field as you. I'm like, 
so what? <laughs> she's like well you always get so prickly when somebody in your field talks about it because you think you know everything i'm like no, 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 no. I, I don't think i know i'm just always trying to learn she's like chuck it on so this guy comes on sharon's like i want to introduce dr mark sholmes he's a south african neuroscientist and he's he's published over 200 articles and journals on human consciousness and written eight books. So I'm keen to hear this guy. And so he gets on and, and Sharon's like, we got Mark, Dr. Mark Shelms here. And she said, I want to ask him questions because they say that how you, your thoughts are how you talk to yourself. But my mom, my mother and I, we, we don't talk to ourselves, but my sister says she does all the time. And Mark comes on and this is how he answers it. So he's an expert in human consciousness. And he says, well, this is how I see it. I'm like, stop, Mackenzie, stop, stop. Go back 15 seconds. She's like, what? 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 He hasn't said anything yet. I'm like, oh, no. He said everything. Go back 15 seconds, please. I want to hear that again. She's like, you're crazy. Goes back 15 seconds and he says it again. He says, well, this is how I see it. I'm like, stop. Did you catch that? She's like, you are crazy. What is going on? I said, Mackenzie, he answered it from the first person. He, this guy is in his 60s, so he's a baby boomer, but yet he is so deliberate. He understands in today's day and age that you've got to speak from a flat, from the first person, not from the third person trying to tell people how it is. If anyone in the world could be, you know, the master of his domain, it's this guy could say, this is how it is. Yeah. But he's so aware mm -hmm. of his thoughts and so deliberate, he delivers everything. Well, this is how I see it, mm. which is not going to offend a person in the world. Yeah. And Bronco, the deliberateness of everything he said, mm. oh, I, I've listened to his podcast so many times just to hear not even the content, but the delivery of how he says what, he, what he's saying. Amazing. There, there, the, 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 the connection with others, especially when it comes to teaching, what I've learned is the words, yes, deliberate and specific and intentional and the more accurate they are, the more powerful, but the tone and manner, and again, the place you're speaking them from, which you just shared, yep. wow, does that uh, um, just make them, it resonates with more, it doesn't capture everyone, but the chance that someone will listen, speaking yep. from not only with the de deliberate and specific words, but the place they're delivering from, delivering yep. them from, to me and through the course of my career, the number of words I spoke was less, the intentionality was increased, the tone was lessened, um, uh, but the delivery more specific, you know, and it just, it was just an evolution, exactly, right? Yeah. love it. And so I want to share this with everyone that's listening is I, I'm fortunate enough to work with people like Bronco and all of his athletes through the years. And I'm fortunate enough to work with this guy called Giannis Anja de Combo. When I work with him, he is looking in my eyes and I feel like every single word out of my mouth needs to be precise because mm. if I'm not, he's not going to trust me yeah. and he just does not have time to deal with people that aren't accurate. He needs truth and he needs exactness because he's got so much else to do and there's so much at stake. Mm -hmm. And that level of exactness is critical. And I understand it. I respect it. And it's why I study so hard to be ready for these sessions because there's so much there that I'm, I, and I'm listening to his words. That's what I found when Bronco asked the questions what is the one common denominator in what doesn't matter to me, whether it's athletics, business, music, the best, the opportunity to be around the best. They are so genuine and authentic and real. Realness is precision and exactness. When you do that, what you find is things that are real and tangible. When we're vague, vague is the enemy. And there's research coming out saying that's one of the reasons we have so many mental health issues because vagueness leads to misdiagnosing where you're at, which then you lose control. Oh. And so I really believe one of the biggest problems behind this mental health epidemic is a lot lack of truth. Mm. I think we've got to come back to truth for our own well-being. You know, I so I love there's just so much in that. I mean, I, I'd just like to keep this going for about a week. But so <laughs> there's tr developing trust is is a sacred thing to me. And, and wow, can it be lost easily? And it's yeah. so hard to gain mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. process. And, and a lot of times as a leader, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, uh, as, as players would come in to visit with me, sometimes at my request, sometimes at their request, same with an assistant coach, same with anyone that came into my office and we'd sit down to visit. 
and a topic would come up um, and I would ask the question, how honest do you want me to be with you? I love that. Yeah. And, and it, it set a, it set a framework where with their permission, I then would move forward with things that could be hard to hear. Yep. Um, but it was with the permission and an intent that they actually wanted to hear that. And, and if they said, well, that depends, you know, we'd, we'd wrestle and talk through that a little bit. So at least the platform going back to trust that I could, I could deliver in relation to, you know, what the expectations were. And if they weren't ready for like the, you can't handle the truth from the movie, yeah, right. With, absolutely. right. If they weren't ready for that, then why deliver it at that po at that point? And it, it might diminish or eliminate a relationship where then might I'd be more ineffective with that player. So I'd love to just hear yeah. because clearly you have trust established with that one player. And I've seen it with the players you've worked with for me for years and that trust component. I, I don't know. I'd like to just pull on that a little bit and, and see what your yeah. thoughts, even more thoughts on that are. So trying to really understand human consciousness and break down what they call cognitive ability, the ability to think and adapt and read the environment. So I think there's two things here. One of the greatest skills I think I've ever learned from a mental toughness is, is to choose my words carefully. That mm -hmm. skill, choose. There's a choice. Mm -hmm. That's what deliberate means. I have a choice how I think. Yeah. I don't have to react to the world. I don't have to react to any other's expectations. They're my own thoughts. And so I have a choice. Words or thoughts, so choose what my words, but I love the word carefully because uh -huh. I need to be careful of the impact and the influence that's having on the environment mm -hmm. and on the people around me. And so I love that skill, choose my words carefully. So I try to be very careful, even on this podcast, of the words I'm saying because I know of the impact it has. And I've got to adapt to those words depending on the level of people I'm talking right. to that and what they can handle. Right. And I think that helps to navigate some very difficult situations. I find myself in business settings where my clients bring me in to have the difficult conversations where so many people don't want to have that. Mm -hmm. But if you can't have the difficult conversations, we never evaluate reality accurately. And therefore, your solutions are always contaminated. Yeah. And it, it's just so important to to be able to choose your words carefully, both in your own head and externally so that you're deliberate and it helps you to navigate the gray areas of life. Mm -hmm. And that's where the richness and the thickness and it's not, it's, you're not living such a black and white life and you can really reap the benefits of life when you, when you develop this critical thinking ability to adapt. You, you mentioned just a, a moment ago in, in the relationship and the very unique relationship you're having with one of the greatest athletes on, on the planet. Um, and you think about that, there's there's um, business work done that it's, defines the best leaders. And it's uh, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, Jim Collins, I think, wrote, it's a unique combination of humility and will. Yeah. And it's interesting, I, I've seen some of the best players that I've had a chance to work with um, uh, self-doubt uh, and not thinking that they are as good as they are. Very few did I ever see thought they were better than what they were the right. best I've yeah. ever coached yeah. the, the, the most elite performers were, were almost overly humble, fiercely committed and willful, yep. but they never viewed themselves. If anything, they viewed themselves lesser than what their true ability was not more. I'm wondering if yeah. that's common or what your thoughts are with that. Yeah. Big time. I agree. I've seen everyone that I see. That's truly great. I like to call them a learner. I know the big awesome. phrase out there is bit having a growth mindset, which I like. Carol Dweck wrote the book mindset. Yeah. And I really like that, but I differentiate that, that, that research was done in the world of academia, which I spend time and I, I value and appreciate, but the performance world where I feel like I've spent most of my life and you've been into, even though I teach a class performance is action. And I love the idea of ha having a learning mentality. When you have a learning mentality, you understand that it's always happening. You can't just stop because the second you stop, you're losing. You're not staying on that cutting edge. Mm. And to me, that cutting edge is staying not necessarily creating new stuff, but you're staying up to date with what's relevant. And you just cannot shut the mind off. The mind craves that, that learning mentality. So I've seen that over and over yeah. again, just people the best are always wanting to learn. They're always trying to evolve. They're always trying to just get better. You know, um, one of the sayings that we, uh, principles we used at Virginia as I kept learning and growing and the program I ran there was an expansion of my first head coaching experience in BYU, but was not identical. 
Uh, and mm -hmm. and some in some cases, right, it would be preserving the core, but stimulating progress. And the prog the progress differences were were striking. And it doesn't always mean it shows up in the exact outcome that's measured. Uh, but we had a saying there, a principle that when you quit learning, you become irrelevant. Yeah. And and that it was more uh, um, an uh, a more a statement of mindset than it yeah. was actuality. Right. And so, mm -hmm. as you said, learning, that was that was the essence of that. See, what's so super interesting. So I learned this from all of all people, Jerry Seinfeld, not that I don't love Jerry Seinfeld, love him, but I'm not never studied, you know, comedic field. That's not my industry. But I was I heard something once that this young comedian was speaking at the same place as Jerry and he caught him backstage and he asked him, you know, what advice do you have for a young up and coming comedic? What have you done? This is Jerry's response. He said, he said, don't break the connect chain. He's like, what does that mean? He says, get a wall calendar and get a red Sharpie marker. And what I do is in order to come up with good work, you have to write two hours every day, mm -hmm. write two hours every single day. And you do a red cross across the calendar that you did it. And the key is don't break the connect chain. He said, if you study every day, some of your stuff's going to get in your jokes. Some of it won't. But you've got to commit yourself to learning. Mm -hmm. So I took that. I'm like, I, I, I don't have two hours a day because I don't. I don't, you know, just perform for one evening or whatever. I'm, I've got athletes and people all day, every day, but I committed to that. And I love this whole idea. These are just notes. I'm just constantly <laughs> studying. I try to do an hour a day. And if I do an hour a day, that's that learning mentality. And, and there's never a thought that, yeah, I'm awesome because I do this or I do that. That, that, that thought never enters your mind because you're just always learning. So it's like this inbuilt way of always staying humble because you're just always learning. There's no other thought other than I'm just trying to learn and get better here. And all you do is just keep doing that. And there's no other identity that you take on other than I'm just trying to get better at what I do. Well, and it's it's so gratifying. At least I felt this and I, I, I bet it resonates um, with most of us is it's so nice when you've studied diligently um, to be ready in a time of need for someone else when they yeah. come to you. Yeah right yeah. to be counseled or to be taught and you actually have studied enough to have answers that are relevant to help them and, yeah. and i think that's so much of the leadership profession is, is is that place and i'm wondering like in your position with the bucks um so do the players come to you voluntarily are they assigned by the coaches does each one have to meet with you like how does that structure work or how have you found that to be most effective not only in the collegiate world or the Olympic world, but in the, the NBA world, how, how does that work? Yeah, actually, I would say I like it better when there's a coach that's completely on board that that at least makes it mandatory to come in a couple of times to meet and learn what it is. Yep. Because what I found when people understand what this really is, the neuroscience and neuroplasticity, their response is always like, oh, I didn't realize this is what it is. This is wow. helping me to get better. Everyone wants I would say, and I've got research that it, it seems to allude to and support. That's one of the biggest ways to build trust with somebody is helping them learn. They they build trust. So I've got a guy on the team. He's from a really rough upbringing, and he is one tough guy. Yeah. And one of the things he said one day to me is the thing he said, the th reason why I love coming in is you're just always committed to helping me. It's never stories about you or anything. It's mm -hmm. just you're trying to help me. And I, and I took that to learn from that, like, Stay focused on them and helping them all the time. Um, the other biggest thing I would say is uh, with the Bucks, no, it's not mandatory. Mm -hmm. And there are some guys, there's, I don't know what the percentage, we have like seven pe 17 people traveling. Probably at least half just came in because they wanted to learn. They heard, you know, you work with one and two and then it spreads and they want it. The other half didn't want it. And I convinced them through, time and just I'm I'm I have a long term and I'm kind of I just <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I almost don't want them to hear this but I'm just skilled at being patient and just waiting and playing the long game and I eventually you know find an opportunity to where they they want to come in and they we do a session and they're like oh yeah I want to meet and do this but they're still there's a couple that you know they they're super cordial they love um, that we'll talk about other things, but they don't come in. Um, I, I think I've worked with everyone at some level, but there's a couple that just don't come in as often as I would like them to. But, you know, that's that's up to them, you know, and I. Yeah. You know, 
a couple of things regarding that the long game i think parents understand the long game really well right and <laughs> and they also understand teachable moments which you yep. mentioned being patient and sometimes a moment develops and someone that's ready and willing with the right motive which is to help and serve yeah right there's an opportunity there and and there's also the power of choice where sometimes right some people in their lives uh, either don't understand it don't think they need it or are oblivious to it or whatever for whatever other reason that doesn't mean it's not valuable not helpful and wouldn't be transformative if they chose it right which is i think that's one of the hard things i bet from your position same from a parent same from a coach is sometimes those that need it most are the most unwilling and unyielding to receive it and and that patience and lack of judgment and just being there when and if right? That's the long game I think you were talking about. Yeah, the long game to me is just, yeah, exactly. P being patient, waiting for the right opportunity and when they open to it, just being ready to address it with them. But within the organization, working with, you know, a significant amount of players on the team, working with some coaches, working with some of the executives, the directors there, working with um, people within the, the team of the sports science. It, over time, people are want to learn and want to get better and it, it's been a fun opportunity for sure it's been you know there's so many experiences that i learned from from them too there was an opportunity where we we're in the playoffs we were going to play brooklyn they had this super team this is a couple of years ago they had almost twice the budget that we had mm -hmm. and all these great players everyone's predicting they're going to win the nba championship we get killed the second game and go down 2-0 by 50 points in brooklyn it was humiliating actually and after it, getting a text from the GM to meet in his office. And it, it, there was tension there, but we had an experience where we went through, we were able to talk about things real, not fluffy, but yeah. really talk about real things. And this meeting lasted near four hours. Wow. And we were able to talk about real things and come up with real solutions with everyone else involved. And that is just so fun to talk about real things and not feel like you can't you're covering up and you're you're being vague and not dealing i just you can't solve problems if you don't build from truth right everything's contaminated from that point and and just that was a wonderful opportunity there to work with them and dig in deep into some things and we end up winning an nba championship which was pretty cool <laughs> you know it, it's it's crazy too and it, i think there's a pattern that repeats in listening to you where, where um, suffering and setback creates this felt need. And sometimes it has to be at such a level and a 50 point loss. Yeah. And I've, I've had losses that are similar to that. And, yep. and it, ex it exposes everything to where you're willing to talk about anything at the mm -hmm. deepest level uh, with someone that can truly partner with you and make a difference. And, and luckily, right. You had that opportunity and the skills and knowledge to, to find a solution to that that had an amazing outcome yeah that was why i love about this organization with now with the bucks the gm and the coach they just embrace all of that opportunity to be able to really talk about hard things but not positive or negative yeah. to me it's stating facts and being real and because to me if you misdiagnose reality mm. if you misdiagnose where you're at your solutions as i've said a few times are contaminated but that's one of the biggest problems we have with the human race we misdiagnose because of vagueness and when we misdiagnose this, we can't really know what we want if we're not sure where we're at. And I think that two-step process is massive, reality and solutions. And I really teach that and I live that as best as I can. What is the reality where we're at and what are the solutions? Reality solutions all the time. So how do you help um, the, the people you're working with? Because they're so lucky to have you where they can come in and talk and, and learn and and have things reiterated and continue to build habits and patterns that will be successful. And also, I'm sure that you're trying to help them become self-reliant um, as much yeah. as possible as well. And I don't know, I'm interested to know. So for on the teams and what I learned from you, uh, there was a journal called the Fearless Mind Journal. And we issued that to every player they were expected to bring into their team meetings. There was time devoted in the meeting for them to be working on that. And so I, I'm wondering, in addition to that, or even if that's a relevant piece um, any longer and, and where you've kind of progressed oh, yeah. to, how, how are you helping? I don't know, from, from lucky they have you, right? And we all, <laughs> I don't know about that, but yeah. no, I, 
I, I would say that for any really skilled, capable leader who's capable of, of helping and with the knowledge to do so, right? Those are huge people in our lives. Um, but eventually you don't always have access to, right? Yeah. And so uh, the self-reliance part of work, I don't know, how are you encouraging them to, to take it and act on it? Um, yeah, great. I think as first, yes, we use the journal all the time and I haven't changed it. I think the journal has been that. the scientific method and I'm, I'm not going to change that because it's built off that, that method. Yeah. And so we still use it. It's still a, a, I think you remember it was a spiral bound. There's yeah. athletes that like love that because they roll it up and put it in their pocket. Yeah. I, I go through them like crazy. I brought in two the other day and one of the athletes uh, we were already talked about grabbed both of them and took them both because of what they want them. We also have it on the app. But one of the biggest things there is, and I think this is a responsibility for anyone that's in my shoes that's listening to this. Our responsibility is to build independence, not to build dependence on us. Our job is to do our job to where they don't need us. Right. There's always more athletes coming through for us to work on. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we need to be aware of is to not build a codependency. We're trying to build. I, I like the whole dependence. We evolve from dependence to independence. Mm-hmm. And then Stephen Covey called it uh, in interdependence. I would actually, I've just changed that a little bit to interindependence. We always want to be careful not to create codependency. It's one of the biggest problems within the parenting world right now. We, we create too much codependency. We're doing it for our kids mm-hmm. and solving problems for them because we think it's just quicker and more efficient to do it for them. We've got to create interindependence, which is collaboration, right? Which is massive from building a culture. We got to build collaboration and allow people to have their space to do it. And so I'm very mindful of that. And I work hard to create that independence in those athletes. So they're the ones in control and teach them how to use the journal and teach them um, some of these techniques. I, I don't don't expect to ever be anywhere forever. You know, I assume that at some point that they'll either get sick of me and want me to move on or, you know, there'll be some other thing. Yeah. come up. So I do know that and I'm working hard to always help them build their skills, but there is quite a lot of skills for them to learn. So I'm working hard. As you said, it takes some time to get good at the mind is one of the most nebulous things there are. And it takes some time to really help people to learn how to control it and master it. And yeah. 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 So there, there's just a, a quick thought as well. And this is, this is um, unpublished and not verified research, but something I paid attention to, to my 17 years as I've been a head coach back to your point of codependence. Um, I, I made a note when we would sign a player, um, from out of state at any place that I coached. And if their parents or family relocated to the community in which, um, the the university was, I just watched and was mindful of those careers. And in most cases they failed miserably. They regressed, Um, do they? Huh? Yeah. Because the, the, um, the, um, the parental influence just, they, they would not step back enough to allow the inter or independence to become and the self-reliance to become. And so there was this pattern of intervention when things got difficult. And so it happened once and I just was mindful of it as I watched it happen. So just to the point you said, I noticed that over my career, if families chose to relocate to the community in which um, their son was going to college. So right? interesting. It, that was, makes sense it, was, it, 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 it does to me now that I heard you say that. It, yeah. And so Anyway, the, um, the other part that to me, I, w- I would love to, to hear about, um, one of the concepts you taught me early on was that of, a, of interference. Yeah. And, and I, I would love you to just to address that. And that was one of the simplest things, but one of the most helpful things that I've ever heard. And so I was wondering if you could go back to just some of the foundational work of how interference plays in. Yeah. And so the classical formula for performance in the literature is potential. We all have potential plus training equals performance. And so I like that, but I thought I had potential playing tennis and I know I trained hard. I, none of my friends trained harder than me. So I know I trained hard, but I did not get where I wanted to go from a pro standpoint. And so to me, there was always something missing. And I found from another coach at BYU, cause we're always, you know, it was very a community there. And it was the old track and field coach there, Dr. Craig Poole. He taught me that there was a guy called Wolfgang Ritzdorf that said, his theory is we have potential but we got to get rid of the interference. So his formula was potential minus interference equals performance. And I just love that idea that we needed to not let things get in the way of ourselves, but we still need to train. So I didn't quite agree with that part. So I took the classical formula, potential plus training, and added the minus interference part to create that formula of potential plus training 
minus interference equals high performance. And, and okay. there's a lot of application there. Yeah. First is that first part of potential is helping people un understand and identify their strengths. And I really do believe we all come with unique strengths and that those strengths is what makes us unique. And one of the biggest things we're trying to do here is overcome our own mediocrity. Mediocrity is not about being mediocre and being like everyone else. Well, it, when we're not focusing on our strengths, we become like everyone else. We become ordinary. But knowing your strengths and building from your strengths is critical. So that's first. Then building skills that build on top of those strengths. It's not just working hard on everything. There's not enough time. It's working hard on the skills that magnify those strengths that propel us forward. Then the interference part is to keep the doubts, the mm. self-doubt and the reactive thoughts out of your mind. So to answer that, we talked about how language dominates human consciousness. The worst thought patterns are subtractive thoughts. The word subtract means to take away. It's a, I can't, it's personal to us. Mm -hmm. And we're telling ourselves what we can't do. Mm -hmm. Those are the most damaging thought patterns you can reinforce. That will literally take your trajectory in the wrong direction. So subtractive thoughts are by far the most toxic and dangerous. Mm -hmm. Second is reactive. The don'ts, don't be late, don't do this. Always living a reactive life, which creates fight or flight. These are patterns that create that internal interference. And we just get in the way of ourselves and we mm -hmm. spiral. Another one, the three big ones are subtractive, reactive thoughts, then needing approval from other people. Because uh, uh. when we're always needing approval, that creates fragmentation. Because you think, Bronco, if you need approval from one person, every time you see that person, you're reacting to that person. Every time you have a thought about that person, you're reacting yeah. to that person. Wow. So I, I'd love to follow up on that for a second. And I, I'm I, I'm going somewhere with this. Um, yeah. in, in a game in my last year at Virginia, I came in at halftime and I saw a player race in and he went to his phone. This is during the halftime of a game. Mm. And and so I didn't react and I didn't make it a, a giant thing. And I was curious more than anything else. And I just kind of peeked over his, his I, I just saw from a distance and he was looking for what people thought of how he played. So, wow. so, so oh, wow. from, from right. And, and so I want to go to social media with you on this. And so these are young people. This is a young person before coaches have talked to him and before he's gotten feedback from those that work with him every day and from teammates, even mm -hmm. he is going now to an external source. And somehow that's become so powerful, right. To yeah. give him feedback. Uh, and, and man, to me, I, I was using the term interference, um, but this idea of having to please or appear one way in front of others, that's kind of where I left was, man, that, how, how will we ever help him reach his potential if he's so focused on what others think yeah. right, of how he's doing? Yeah, I saw some research actually in the business world lately that this guy spent 20 years, Bill George, spent 20 years studying leadership failure. And he said the number one way, reason we fail is we get distracted by money, fame, and power, mm. which I love that money, which I think comes from results. We crave results. We get paid more. So money, fame is fame is that approval from social media, approval from others, how many people follow us, and then power, this hierarchy, thinking we got to be above others and get higher up on the hierarchy. Those things distract us from our true north, which we've heard that phrase before. But true means starts with being true to yourself. What are your beliefs and what which creates your value, which comes right back to strengths. When you know your strengths, your unique strengths, you have value in who you are. You don't need any of this other stuff. So knowing what, what your beliefs are and that creates your value. And only then can you know where you're trying to go. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is just massive to be able to overcome that as comes back to we all have strengths. Figure out your strengths and it gets rid of comparison. It gets yeah. rid of the need for approval from the world. So, and, and I want to go further here. Here's the slippery road for all of us. Comparison is dangerous. You don't think it's bad because everyone's doing it all the time with social media, but comparison creates insecurities. Yes. And then insecurities leads to we need approval. And we don't realize that needing approval is the beginning, opens yourself up to abuse. Mm. 
all abuse, both mild and really serious abuse comes wow. because you're bumping yourself up to need approval from the world. Mm -hmm. So you put yourself vulnerable in allowing others to tell you how to do things and who you are, which then leads to inferiority and superiority complexes. Wow. And so there's this slippery road that we can fall into. So, so could you, for our listeners, can you hit that cycle one more time? That, that was really powerful. And I, I rarely take notes, but I got to write this down while, while you want. So, so hit that one more time, will you? Yeah. So it starts with comparison. We don't realize how dangerous that is. And we got to break that, which will explain how you break that. So which in the world of sport, right? Cause you're comparing yourself. All the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. All the time. So don't, so number one, comparison leads to insecurities. Yep. Insecurities leads to you need to open yourself up to need approval from the world, which is giving yep. you control away, yep. which then leads to complexes, which is so interesting. We think that inferiority complex and superiority complex are different. They're actually the same complex. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I feel inferior because, because I'm bold, so then every time I see somebody with hair, I feel inferior. But then every time I see somebody with that is, is balding but hasn't shaved their hair, I feel superior to, can you see, and around and around we go. <laughs> in, in, in academia, if it's if somebody you think you're smarter, then you feel superior. Then you see somebody that and it never ends. It's this vicious cycle that you're constantly feeling superior or ir, inferior to whoever you're around. It's just this vicious cycle that you're constantly searching, find, trying to find somebody that you can feel superior to to feel good about yourself. And the way to break that is acknowledging and authentically seeing your strengths. We it all is. have strengths. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I again, I, I don't really, I, it, for the sake of this, I don't really care what religious affiliation anyone is. But I do believe we come to this planet with God-given gifts. Mm -hmm. And those gifts are what make us unique. Mm -hmm. And there's how you become your authentic self by being true to you. That has nothing to do with anyone else. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with understanding and learning how to unlock and use your strengths. Yeah. And then building skills on top of that. When you do that, that that we, we don't, there's no competition with anyone else. Yeah. Competition is with yourself, just trying to break your own, overcome your own mediocrity. Yeah. I think I, I love that too. And what, what I believe as well as so much of our life, if we, if used well is discovering what gifts we have mm -hmm. and, and, and if they've been, if they've laid dormant, sometimes it's because we haven't looked hard enough to discover them and, mm -hmm. and find the things that really make us uniquely special. And so I think the discovery part of our gifts is is one component as well. And then, as you mentioned, magnifying them, helping them become right. That's a that's a lifelong set of work, regardless of what anyone else on the planet is doing. Yeah. Right. That's that's a, enough already to do that. Have, yes. have you, go ahead. No, please go for it. I was just going to say um, back to the idea quickly. Um, and maybe as we just kind of finish up, how how has at, at, at the NBA level oh, managing the social media and or the fame or the the external influences right how how much of i don't know how much do you have to address that in your work um how prevalent or i don't know help us understand what that looks like um yeah great one of the biggest ways i think we try to try to circumvent that is the learning always try to be learners and we're I'm, we're super fortunate that the leaders on our team are humble guys oh. and we have three three key guys that are all humble and that just really creates the, the, the culture and the, the direction of the team is, is massive. And I think that really helps the whole team when they see that the level of humility there, I think that's massive, but there was also another part there. Uh, well, sorry, what was the other part to your question there? I uh, just, just the social media and managing oh, right. maybe the fame and external influences yeah. and, and like what um, I don't know what strategies and structures and, and what I'm seeing is, right, that's prevalent at the college level and with young people. And, man, it does not seem like we're winning that. Um, it seems like yeah. that's creating a lot of interference and a lot of approval nece uh, necessity. And I'm just wondering at the NBA level, a professional level, if you're seeing yeah. something similar, how you deal with that. Yeah. And so for me, I know exactly what I do. I'm just pausing to choose my words. Like, I'm just super direct with these guys. I just tell them we need to be humble. I'm the one that's like, you got to stay humble because as soon as you think you've arrived, you lose your focus, you get distracted and you're in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk all the time, like your ego, when you're thinking you're awesome, you're in the past. Mm -hmm. and that's where ego comes from. You're always living in the past and what you have done and you're distracted now. And I talk to them about, I just try to coach them as good as best as I can and using analogies. I said, that's like driving on the freeway 
looking over your shoulder. Think about how catastrophic that is when you're always looking behind you and how awesome are the things you've done. You got to stay in the present all the time and you're only as good as the next game you're about to play. Yeah. So constantly just reminding them how important it is to stay humble. And again, luckily we have guys that are humble, but the social media part too, there's several guys that once a season, most people probably don't even know this, but once the season starts, they turn their social media over to other people and they don't do it themselves yeah. because they don't want it to distract them during the season. Several guys in the team don't do their own social media. They have somebody else doing it for them. Um, and then there's others that they do do it, but there's certain points that they have to switch it off because of how much of a distraction it is. And it's part of their brand, right? It's the world they live in now. They get Nike and that make more money depending on that. So it's part of their business. But it is a source of distraction that we're always trying to monitor from a mental strength standpoint. Yeah. In terms of full disclosure, I didn't manage my own account. There was, uh, I was compelled to think it was industry standard to have one. When I, as a head coach, I never once looked at it. Someone else was managing it, and it might have been the least active in all of college football. But uh, it, knowing yourself, right? If you happen to be prone to caring what others think, yeah, um, you have to be really careful about who you allow to, to share that with you. And I don't know, I just, um, so I would love uh, for our listeners, the fearless mind journal is something that was so powerful. Um, the fearless mind, the book itself um, and where else Craig, uh, I know there's so many other things that you've developed since uh, I've worked with you, but I'm sure there's an app and websites and everything else. Could you share like where, even while you're working with the bucks, is there any way else for people to find out what you're doing, how you're doing it or, or learning? Yeah, so there's still the book, and then you can get the the hard copy the journal from blurb.com. Okay. Uh, so I put them on there so that I, because I can only get so many out to people, but yeah, on blurb.com. Then I'm actually in the middle of developing a more updated uh, digital platform. So I still have the website, but it's not as up to date as it was before because I've developed so much content since I've seen you last. I've just, so that content I'm working on putting together on a new platform. But those are the two main things for right now is, is still the book and uh, yeah, the hard copy journal is on blurb.com. Well, just uh, really appreciate you taking the time. And and so for our listeners, the the messaging I, I've applied, I've learned my players that, so that's 125 players per year for when yeah. Craig and I started, I don't know, that was right at the beginning. So let's say that's 17 years, that's thousands of young people, at least in our time that have been able to be exposed and at least presented with this information and, it's been really impactful. That's why I asked Craig on. I'm sure everyone just can see and, and feel the same thing. So really appreciate your time and just profound. Thanks, Bronco. I appreciate it. Yeah, always wonderful experience working with you, and it's great to connect again. So thank you, and thanks, Brian. I appreciate you hosting. So, Brian, back, back to you, Brian. Back to me, back to me. Well, Craig, before we get you out of here, I did. A, I guess I was a little curious on that front. Uh, you know, you work with a lot of those athletes in those those team environments, but you you have that tennis background. You worked a lot with your skiing and 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 kind of high performance uh, Olympic sports. Have you noticed a big difference between kind of the mentality between those in that team environment versus those that are kind of out there alone performing? If they're on the tennis court alone, if they're on the ski slope alone, you know, it's so interesting. People ask me that question all the time. The honest truth is. The mind is the mind. Everyone's personality is different and everybody, because as we talked about, the human consciousness is all different. But it, to me, I switched from an accountant's firm, coaching a, an accounting team to a football team. And it's it, it's kind of seamless to me. It really doesn't make any difference. I'd tell you about the only thing that's different is people that play tennis are obviously some of the smartest and brightest and and best human beings on the planet, right? If you play, I'm just kidding, but you know, <laughs> no, I, I don't really see of our show just went down right there. We, we, we were doing pretty good for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as, as, as a tennis player myself, I, I totally agree with you on, on that front. We'll all have to get out there and maybe we'll, 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 we'll play a couple matches and we'll, we'll see how uh, Broncos backhand is doing from, from those oh, days uh, that you guys oh, had no. there at BYU. But uh, Dr. Craig Manning, uh, the author of The Fearless Mind, thank you so much for, for joining Bronco and I and, and for everybody else out there. Uh, please enjoy the ne next episode. We'll, we'll catch you again then.